I'm a Republican. No, I'm not a Republican like that. I'm not a Republican like that or that or that. Whatever's in your mind, I'm not that. Republicanism is a branch of political philosophy rooted in the principles of individual autonomy and freedom. It starts with an uncontroversial claim that human beings are generally able to think of and pursue a conception of the good life. This grounds Republican political philosophy in individual liberty. We all ought to be able to pursue our conception of how to live a good life without hindrance so long as we're not blocking someone else. Now, where it differs from liberalism or libertarianism is that it understands liberty in a more complex form. It's not simply the absence of interference. What we're looking for when we're Republicans is the absence of arbitrary interference. This is because unlike most branches of liberalism, Republicans don't view the state as a necessary evil. It is the precondition of our freedom. A state that has proper checks and balances, that has accountability, that is characterized by the rule of law, doesn't diminish liberty. It creates it. By checking arbitrary power, which is power that acts without any reference to the person who it's being used against, uh, from both private actors and the states, we can create conditions of political freedom for citizens. Freedom isn't just the ability to do things. It is also, in a way that's very important, a status. It's a, a way that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am free to live my life how I choose. You don't have to worry about someone stopping you from how, to, how you want to live your life just because they think it's wrong or just on a whim, right? This is the basis of republicanism. So how does republicanism relate to epistocracy? Well, there certainly has been a strong anti-democratic trend, even an epistocratic trend in the history of Republican thought. Writers from Cicero, writing at the twilight of the Roman Republic, to Francesco Guicardini, writing in uh, Renaissance, what was he? Renaissance Venice and Florence. Uh, they both warned against the passions of the mob and the need to check the mob by an aristocracy. Now, aristocracy in our minds tends to mean uh, the wealthy, or the privileged, but the original meaning of aristocracy is the excellent, not the wealthy. So they say we need the excellent to rule, not the wealthy. Uh, this has been an ongoing debate in republicanism because it ultimately comes down to who do you trust at the end of the day to prevent arbitrary power from taking root in the state? Do you trust the people or do you trust the elite? Indeed, this has been something of a debate that I've had with my colleagues over whether Republicans need to be Democrats. Frank Lovett, for example, has argued that we can imagine something like an idealized apartheid. Now, in this idealized apartheid, there is a privileged racial minority and there is a disadvantaged racial majority. Uh, so some people get access to education. Some people have the vote. Some people have perhaps uh, access to better public facilities simply on the basis of skin color. Is this an instant where some people are freer than others? Now, according to Lovett, it's not. It's not a case of domination or arbitrary power if there is rule of law. So if these rules are enforced impartially, there cannot be said that there is an absence of liberty. So if a cop crosses a line and say beats up someone in the racial majority uh, where he had no right to do so, and that would be sanctioned by law, he'd be arrested. But someone in the racial minority might apply to a university from which they're excluded, and they will say, you can't go. Now, the point that Lovett's making is that you're able to plan reliably in these circumstances. You simply aren't in a condition of perpetual anxiety about interference. You know the scope of your action. You can plan accordingly. Now, I think Lovett misses a pretty big point when he makes this case. The rules may be impartially enforced, but it's their establishment that would be the act of arbitrary power that then taints the entire political system, right? If we establish an ideal apartheid system, the people who are in the discriminated majority they're not going to consent to that. It has to be imposed on them without their consent. That is a foundational act of arbitrary power that then proliferates through the entire system. Because if a person is unable to contest or alter the terms of social cooperation, we cannot say that they are free from arbitrary power. Now, this might be true for apartheid or authoritarianism, but is it necessarily true for epistocracy? Now, surely the clearest difference between the apartheid example and an epistocracy is that you can pass the knowledge test, 
right? If we think about epistocracy as just having, you know, a set down test that you do, uh, you show that you know the political system, you show that you're not sort of affected by irrationality, then you can cross over. Whereas in the apartheid example, you can never change your race, so you're permanently excluded. Epistocracy lets people become enfranchised. It has no intrinsic discrimination. However, there is an old school Republican issue at play, and that is quis custodiet ipso custodes, who watches the watchers? Or as David Runciman recently put it, who sets the test? This seems like arbitrary power. There is a problem around someone writing the knowledge test because it relies on them behaving honestly. Now, this is really similar to that demographic objection that I mentioned earlier, right? But it's simpler. The demographic objection says that the knowledgeable can still have all sorts of cognitive biases, just like other people who don't go to university, who don't pass the epistocratic test. Uh, you know, their racial background, their class background, their gender background might all bring with them a lot of cognitive biases. This is the objection. However, my problem with this is that it implies that it's possible that there could be instances where we could get rid of this bias, right? If we could control for the bias of the epistocrats, then there would be really no basis for the demographic objection. This, however, doesn't pass the Republican sniff test. An unbiased epistocrat would still be exercising arbitrary power when they set the test, even if they were using it with goodwill. The issue here is about the structure of power between agents and institutions. You can imagine something like a benevolent slave owner who treats the slave she owns very well. She never interferes in their life. Uh, she gives them a better standard of living than people who aren't even slaves, but her slaves would still be slaves. They would still be subject to her whims. The ability of the epistocrat to set the exam gives them arbitrary power over the status of their fellow citizens. It doesn't matter if they abuse it. The psychological disposition of epistocrats is immaterial. What we're interested in is their power. And it goes into the even deeper versions of epistocracy, not just the knowledge test. Think, for example, about the artificial intelligence oracle. Who programs the oracle? There's been a lot of really interesting work recently about computer science and prejudice. A lot of the AI that's getting generated is becoming, well, horribly racist when it's doing its learning algorithms because it is learning from us. Could we actually produce a super intelligent AI that could simulate Australian democracy without it being corrupted by the people who were programming it unconsciously? And even if we could say we could control for it, would we want to give anyone that arbitrary power to generate a super sentient artificial intelligence? A reply comes from Anne Jeffrey, who focuses on the importance of independent standards. She says that the epistocrat does have a very important check on their power, and that is objective truth or reason. Their status and claims can be challenged, but it's only on the basis of using acceptable evidence. It's intrinsic in an epistocrat to be open to persuasion. They have to be open to listening, right? Uh, so they can say, well, I am open to persuasion. If you can show that the test is biased, we will amend it. And we have to have at least some sort of faith in objective truth. And she provides an example of medical staff working in Liberia during the most recent Ebola outbreak. They found that despite the efforts of public health specialists, the disease continued to spread. One of the factors causing this was non-compliance of ordinary people due to cultural or religious beliefs about the disease. You know, people wanted to handle the bodies of people who had died from Ebola. Now, Ebola is spread through bodily fluids, right? These citizens didn't have proper reasons. So you can say, well, it's part of honoring our dead that we have to wash them. It makes sense, but it is not a proper reason to an epistemic authority of the medical staff, right? The medical staff is gonna say, don't touch the bodies with your bare hands, don't wash them. They need to be isolated immediately and then burned. There doesn't have to be an obligation to listen to people's sensitivity on this issue. There's an obligation to pursue the best public health course. Uh, we can see this also in the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of people complained about uh, restrictions because of face masks or getting their jabs. Uh, this was seen as a problem because they were challenging epistemic authority on grounds that wasn't really relevant, right? Uh, we know how the disease spread, and it doesn't matter if people feel uncomfortable wearing a mask or getting a jab. They need to do it. They're not doctors. They're not epidemiologists. Not everyone is created equal in the eyes of knowledge. And this, well, 
It undermines a lot about democracy where we think everyone's opinion is equal, doesn't it? However, there is a problem still for someone like me. Now, I can agree that there might be rational ways of thinking about medicine and public health. Indeed, I do believe it. But I'm worried about internal constraints. All of this rests on the willingness of public health authorities to be open to reason and to follow evidence. It requires goodwill and a commitment to the truth to work. The epistocrat who determines what is evidence and who is an authority is solely relying on their own judgment. There is no invigilation from a third party. Now, Jeffrey's example seems really unproblematic, right? I mean, we can also, yeah, you know, spreading Ebola or spreading COVID-19, this is bad. We should try to avoid it. However, we can have a contrast to this with particular scandals in humanitarian assistance. In 2018, the London Times alleged that senior Oxfam staff in Haiti had paid earthquake survivors for sex, and an internal report from Oxfam described a culture of impunity among aid workers in the country. They were acting without any constraints on their power. And this wasn't an isolated incident. In 2002, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees and Save the Children UK discovered widespread sexual exploitation of women and girls in East African refugee camps by aid workers. These men were in a position to use their control over vital goods and employment resources to exercise arbitrary power over their victims. Now, the people who were their victims did not have a way to challenge them, right? They thought that if they spoke out, they would lose access to important resources, employment, food, medicine. And this is not to assert that humanitarian aid is rife with sexual exploitation of vulnerable people. The point is that placing one's faith in the goodwill, professionalism, or rationality of someone is not a sufficient check against domination. It is a dangerous gamble. Let's go back to the example of the doctor. These are licensed practitioners. We want them to be qualified because they have power over us. Now, they are also disproportionately from privileged backgrounds. Uh, if you look at the demographics of doctors, they tend to come from the middle class and the upper middle class. But this, according to Brennan, doesn't make them unjust. Simply because someone comes from a particular background doesn't mean that they are corrupt. But again, Brennan misses the point. If I don't like my doctor, I can get a new one, right? I can simply walk away and get a second opinion. In fact, there's legislation in the UK right now that is protecting the right of people to get second opinions from their doctors. However, the state is not the same. It's very difficult to actually exit from the state, to resign your citizenship. We are born into it. Uh, there is a distinct difference from voluntary associations and involuntary ones. The state is an involuntary association for most people. If you can't exit it, you have higher scrutiny. James Harrington, one of the sort of key writers for republicanism in the mid 17th century, gave us an incredibly simple but powerful way to understand the importance of dividing and checking power. He asks us to imagine two girls and they're trying to decide how to divide a cake. He says that the way that it should go is that the girl who gets to cut the cake can't choose the first slice. The other girl gets to choose the first slice. The problem with epistocracy is that it wants to cut and choose. Epistocracy is often criticized by drawing on historical examples, such as knowledge-based tests for voting. In the Jim Crow South, for example, literacy tests were used to exclude black voters on the basis of race, not on the basis of knowledge. Black voters would show up and they could say, I can sign my name, I know how to read, I can read this. And they'd say, I don't think you know how to read, you can toddle off. And if they said, no, I'm a citizen, I'm going to vote, then they would probably suffer a beating on a good day, a lynching on a bad day. Now, Brennan thinks that this example is in bad faith. And there's something to this, right? He's saying this wasn't a genuine epistocratic test. The fault in the Jim Crow example lays with the background injustices. He has a point, but he does miss the point. The problem is that black citizens were disenfranchised, not simply by the background injustices, by the use of arbitrary power that they could not contest. So it wasn't just that they were being excluded on the grounds of the racism of, uh, of the people at the polling station. It was that these people had the power to exclude them to begin with in a way that they could not contest, right? So there was no way of saying, no, I can actually vote. I can actually read, I have literacy 
There was no vehicle by which you could hold the sort of fake epistocrat to account. And the same applies with genuine epistocrats. The problem is that even under circumstances where epistocrats have an open mind, they might not be able to recognize perspectives that are different from their own epistemic standards, even if these standards are actually legitimate. The status of being a privileged knower enables people to avoid inconvenient truths. Uh, Udit Bacha has given the example of the dictator's game, which is a social experiment uh, in order to illustrate this. Now, in this game, we have a player, and the player is given two choices. Uh, they can choose two pots of money. Now, in the first choice, they get a really high payoff, but another person gets next to nothing. The second choice, they can take a slightly lower payoff, and the second person gets a much higher sum as well. Now, when this is public knowledge, most people choose the latter, right? They want people to have a fair shake. But there is an interesting variation where the second person, the person who receives the bonus money, is ignorant of the rules. Under these circumstances, most people choose the first option. They choose to get the higher sum and let the other person get next to nothing. And they don't ask any more questions about how they should treat the second person. Now, Bacha says that this shows how epistocrats would have motivation to ignore structural injustices from which they benefit. So you wouldn't ask, oh, am I actually being open? You don't interrogate your own power. You just assume it's there. And it's not necessarily malevolent either. This is just something that's in our background. And if we have this background, if we reliably know that this is how human beings behave through social psychology, then we need to be aware that this is a problem. Ultimately, it creates the case for creating secure background conditions in democratic states. It's a better way of maintaining liberty and autonomy. Epistocracy runs a great risk of creating problems of epistemic injustice and domination. A democracy may be vulnerable to ignorance, uh, and conspiracy theories intersection with populism can itself be a threat to autonomy and liberty. You know, we have to always think about balance. Just because it's democratic doesn't necessarily mean it's good. We need, always need to have checks and balances. We need to have blended ways of making sure that no single group in society has more power than the other. We have to do this, however, by correcting the conditions of insecurity and cynicism that drive conspiracy theories. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching, everyone. And I'll see you next week.